here yesterday. Uh, this week. This yes. week, yeah. So, um, okay, great. I see we have some questions. Please go right ahead. Yes, uh, uh, I, I was aware of the, the program that had uh, our judges visiting Russia and the Russian judges visiting here, and I think one of the hallmarks of our society is an independent judiciary, and I was wondering if any of the panel members could comment on whether the judge and or judges who are sitting in on the Kodakovsky trial will be able to render an independent decision or whether they are politically staffed. Um, I'll, I'll make one comment and then uh, uh, let the others who would like to comment um, weigh in. There is a, a sort of slang term that's often used to describe um, the uh, justice system in Russia, and they call it telephone justice. And what is meant by that is that in cases that have some political significance or bearing or in some way impact on people in political power, the judge waits for a telephone call and that basically instructs him as to what he is to do. Um, you know, uh, Mikhail, in his last words to the court, um, following the conclusion of the trial, and we had handouts of those um, very eloquent and powerful comments, and if you didn't get them, I'd encourage you to pick them up on your way out. Really, he addresses the judge in his final remarks and um, essentially calls upon him to have the courage to do the right thing. Um, so it is, uh, you know, I think there are sort of two tracks. You have cases where there are political implications, where those in power, um, whether, whether at the highest levels or at lower levels within the uh, bureaucracy, um, have interests. And there, I think um, it's, there's a pretty widespread sense that justice is severely compromised. Um, I'll give uh, uh, my perspective. Uh, when Putin came to power, uh, one of his tasks uh, right away was to dismantle the more democratic uh, process of, um, pro not so much process, but more uh, democratic setup uh, of power that uh, Yeltsin had, had managed to establish in his years in office, and uh, he began to morph it into so-called vertical of power. Well, unfortunately, that vertical of power uh, transcends everything, including the judicial system, and uh, in the uh, in Moscow, in particular, there is a vertical of uh, subordination. So uh, the judge that presides over my dad's case, uh, Danilkin, uh, he uh, most likely is directly uh, reporting to and taking orders from the Moscow city court judge. Uh, so I expect him to coordinate the decision. Uh, was his superior at the city court. I have a, just a very brief comment, which is, a, I suppose, an indirect answer to the question. Katya Guryanova, the woman in the film, who's the wife of Pavel Ivlev, the young woman who flees with her children and has this terrible um, harassment at the airport, she's a lawyer herself. And her mother was actually a federal judge in Soviet times. Her mother was a federal judge, I think, for 20 some odd years. And I could have made a film just about Katya and her mother, actually. Um, and she told me, kind of in a, one of her pauses, in one of the interviews I did with her, that her mother actually ultimately resigned because as the, the country opened up, <coughs> And under Yeltsin, and then eventually under Putin, that the pressure that was brought to bear on judges was something unbelievable. And it was much more overt and extreme than it was during Soviet times. And she and many, many of her colleagues eventually resigned because they had never been subjected to anything like that before. So I, you know, that's about eight years ago, ten years ago, but it is indicative of what is going on. And there actually have been lots of um, articles in the papers about the uh, judges actually resigning and speaking out and pressure being put on judges who have resigned essentially not to speak about 
why they're resigning. So, um, I just comment that since we've been going over, uh, the looks of the judiciary are, are, are much more professional. I mean, we don't have vodka toast at 10 a.m. anymore or anything like that, as was really standard when we first began going over. Um, the, the judges have gotten, you know, a great, probably raises of eight to ten times what they were making when we first went over. Uh, that's what they wanted to know. Two things the judges would ask us. One, uh, how much money do you make? And the second thing was, why do people obey your uh, Orders, which, um, you know, I, I had it kind of took me aback, and I had to really think through why why I do that. Um, but, but I mean, it's a it's a totally different culture. It's a, the culture so, they're so different, and 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 uh, they're the judges are becoming much more professional. I mean, they're getting some new buildings. They're you know they it, they're getting technology. It looks much better. Uh, but, I, but the thing is what, I, I don't think, you know, you read about the corruption of the judiciary. I don't think it's really a situation, um, and I think less so where we go than in probably Moscow. I don't think it's a situation where people are, judges are taking bribes and people are calling them and telling them what to do, so much as it's just the culture. You, there's no need to call. I mean, they, they know what, how they're, they're supposed to decide. I mean, uh, in, in Soviet times, which wasn't very long ago, uh, the judiciary was simply uh, a means of carrying out the government orders. And, um, you know, it's only been maybe not even 20 years. And to change a culture like that, whether it ever will really change, um, I, I don't know. But, um, <coughs> It's, it's kind of discouraging because prosecutors are very, very powerful. If you have a case with a prosecutor, you know, uh, they, the judges only acquit 1% uh, of defendants. Uh, when there's a jury trial, the acquittal rate is about 20%, but then the state gets to appeal and they usually do it over again. So uh, even then it's not good. Not yes. One of the things that I think is important is to try to understand what the motivations are. And I'm, and I'm wondering what you all think Putin is trying to accomplish. I mean, what is it that he's looking to do? Is it simply, I looked at the Soviet system as a, as a different manifestation of basically what happened with the Tsar. So very few people with a great deal of power concentrated in their hands. Is that what he's really trying to do? Um, and and if, if you think that's what he's trying to do, is he likely to be successful in that? Can he put that cat back in the bag um, in, in some sense? Or is, or is there enough um, experience or exposure to some more democratic principles that, that, that that's going to be difficult for him to maintain over the long term? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to the rest of us. Um, Two things Putin is trying to accomplish. Uh, first of all, the preservation of uh, power. Uh, he's trying to accomplish that because um, in my opinion, he is essentially uh, a prisoner of his situation. Uh, he has developed a system uh, which only means that he can go on. Uh, as many independent you know, people who are removed from the situation have commented on in the film, he has this entourage of people who have profited a lot from the renationalization of companies. And uh, my dad's company is only a uh, single but not singular uh, example of what has happened uh, since 2000. Uh, there were numerous instances where the companies have been taken back, uh, but the government is not really profiting. It's just been changing hands. The property has been changing hands. Uh, so power, preservation of power is essential because uh, it allows for protection of acquired assets. And uh, many people indicate
with that.